Few know that one of the most tightly sealed borders on the planet isn't between sworn enemies, but rather between two Arab neighbors. The Gaza-Egypt border is way more tightly sealed than Israel's border with Egypt is. You wonder, why would Egypt, basically an Islamic nation, go through so much trouble trying to keep Palestinians out? It is not only Egypt. Jordan and Lebanon also have, along with many other Middle Eastern countries, dug their feet in firmly to refuse en masse Palestinian refugees. Sharing a language, culture, and religion with Palestinians, these countries nonetheless put up literal and political barriers to prevent the mass migration of people. But why? The answer is not quite that simple. Apparently very counterintuitive, the Arab countries seem to be turning their backs on the Palestinians. But it does have depths in historical and political roots. The experience of hosting Palestinian refugees has left these nations cautious, at times scarred, be it from civil wars to economic upheavals. In this video, we go deep into how historical events sculpted the refugee policies of Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and beyond. We are going to set out to see how alliances with Palestinian leaders in the past led to political instability, and how geopolitics today, the Abraham Accords have turned around priority of the region. Reluctance to accept refugees is not all about borders. It's about survival, stability, and national security. Join us as we go back to why the Middle East, which was once for the Palestinian refugees, changed course. The Palestinian refugee crisis originally arose from two of the most important events in the Middle East, the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and the 1967 Six-Day War. Following the creation of Israel in 1948, an armed conflict ensued that led to over 700,000 Palestinians being forced to migrate from their homelands. They moved into bordering countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, and Kuwait. While some opened their borders, it very soon became much more than a humanitarian gesture. King Abdullah of Jordan welcomed a massive inflow of Palestinians following the 1948 war and even gave them citizenship. The reason Jordan did so was to cement its rule over the West Bank annexed by Jordan in 1950. Lebanon and Egypt kept a more aloof attitude, allowing in Palestinians as refugees, but refusing to grant them full rights and citizenship. Palestinians were mostly relegated to camps, living in limbo, with extremely limited opportunities for assimilation. The second wave of displacement came about due to the Six-Day War in 1967. Hundreds of thousands more Palestinians took flight as Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip and most of those ended up going to the same countries which were hosting their brethren. This became a massive refugee crisis overnight, which easily placed heavy burdens on host nations for changes in their internal politics and economies. What seemed at the moment to be a temporary stopgap became a permanent fixture, one that permanently transformed the regional landscape. On its part, with this crisis well underway, another protagonist emerged to center stage, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Founded in 1964, the PLO strove for the liberation of Palestine through armed struggle. At first, under the protection of the Arab League, it developed an increasing strength and influence that aptly represented the political and military aspirations of the displaced Palestinians. Under the leadership of Yasser Arafat, it soon turned from a mere resistance organization into one that was quasi-governmental in nature speaking on behalf of Palestinians, both within occupied territories and refugee camps. On the other hand, however, with the rise of the PLO, complications arose in the relationships between Palestinian refugees and their host countries. Back in the late 1960s, the PLO could boast its own military wings and started cross-border attacks on Israel quite often from within host countries, such as Jordan and Lebanon. Such actions made host nations quite vulnerable to retaliatory strikes against Israel, adding more instability to fragile states. Furthermore, the increasingly autonomous PLO came into conflict with the interests of its host governments, which more and more began to perceive the organization as a threat to their own sovereignty. The tensions between the PLO and King Hussein's government reached an all-time high in Jordan in the late 1960s. The PLO had actually created a sort of state within a state in Jordan, replete with its own military and political institutions. This situation was brought to a head in September 1970 to be referred to subsequently as Black September, 
in which Jordanian forces clashed with the PLO, leading to several thousand deaths and the eventual expulsion of the organization from Jordan. Similarly, the PLO military presence in southern parts of the country also disturbed the sensitive sectarian balance of power in Lebanon. Operating raids into Israel, the PLO drew Lebanon into the crossfire. It plunged the entire country deep into the wider Arab-Israeli conflict, to which it would contribute a great deal later in 1975 with an outbreak of civil war. Thus, the refugee question became intertwined with wider political struggles. The Palestinians were no longer the victims of dispossession and persecution, but active claimants to political and military self-expression, as embodied in the PLO, which was increasingly to emerge as a decisive factor in the changing balance of power in the region. For their part, the governments of the host countries, whose initial reactions had indeed been sympathetic, came to realize that large-scale Palestinian communities could rock the foundations of their stability and thus reconsider their refugee policies. The Kuwait of the 1950s was a small Gulf country on the threshold of brisk transformation. The discovery of oil indeed plunged the country into an unparalleled period of economic growth, with Kuwait turning into one of the most affluent countries on earth. And the country needed skilled labor for fueling its development, and Palestinians fitted the bill perfectly, being well-educated and experienced. During this time, thousands of Palestinians moved to Kuwait and became the backbone of the workforce in Kuwait. The Palestinians in Kuwait were not relegated to low-skilled labor. Instead, they filled important positions in education, health, and government administration, and contributed significantly toward the development and modernization of the country. By the 1970s, Palestinians became one of the largest expatriate communities in Kuwait, enjoying a relatively high standard of living and more rights compared to their Arab peers elsewhere. Unlike in Jordan or Lebanon, Palestinians in Kuwait were not set in refugee camps. Though they were somewhat integrated in society, they were not granted Kuwaiti citizenship. Although not formal citizens, the Palestinians continued to play a very vivid role in Kuwaiti society, running businesses, teaching in schools, even sometimes contributing to the political and cultural life. Kuwait became an important hub for the Palestinian diaspora, with many Palestinians sending remittances back home to support their families in the West Bank, Gaza, or refugee camps. This period of harmony and prosperity between Kuwait and its Palestinian community came abruptly to an end, however, in dramatic fashion early in the 1990s. The breaking point was the Gulf War of 1990, 1991. On August 2nd, 1990, Iraq, under the tight reign of Saddam Hussein, invaded and occupied Kuwait. The invasion caused shock all over the world and was unequivocally condemned internationally. While most Arab countries condemned the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, headed by Yasser Arafat, aligned themselves with Saddam Hussein in an ill-thought-out decision. Arafat embraced the Iraqi invasion due to complexities in politics and strategic alliances. Saddam had been a long advocate for the Palestinians, and Arafat felt that support for Iraq might provide a fresh lever for the Palestinians in their struggle against Israel. Yet, this was the gamble that backfired big time. Feeling betrayed by the PLO's support of its aggressor, Kuwait turned against its Palestinian community almost in a single stroke of action. Once the Iraqi forces were expelled at the beginning of 1991, the Kuwaiti government launched an intensive purge against Palestinians living in the country. Once partners in development, Palestinians were now considered to be traitors who aligned themselves with the enemy. Between 200,000 and 250,000 Palestinians were expelled from Kuwait in the aftermath of the Gulf War. Most refugees had lived in Kuwait for decades. They were given little time to leave Kuwait, abandoning their homes and livelihoods. Their expulsion was both direct and indirect. The policies that the Kuwaiti authorities applied were those making life impossible for Palestinians, such as the withdrawing of residence permits, the closure of Palestinian schools, and the termination of employment contracts. Therefore, the majority of Palestinians fled voluntarily into other countries like Jordan. The expulsion of the Palestinians from Kuwait has resulted in unforeseen, intensive ramifications. For the Kuwaitis, it was the parting shot toward what had been a symbiotic relationship with the Palestinian community. Another painful chapter of displacement and loss for the Palestinians. Many ended up in refugee camps with neither steady homes nor jobs. Furthermore, the split between Kuwait and the Palestinian leadership 
hurt the broader pan-Arab consensus that once united the region in support of the Palestinian cause. The Kuwait experience is certainly a dramatic example of how political miscalculations can turn allies into enemies. The PLO's decision to support Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War harmed not just Palestinians in Kuwait, but contributed to the growing reluctance of Arab countries that would accept Palestinian refugees in the years that came afterward. Jordan became a main destination for Palestinian refugees after the 1948 Arab-Israeli War while they fled the new state of Israel. King Abdullah I was hospitable to them, fully integrating most of the refugees within Jordanian society. Unlike other Arab countries, Jordan granted citizenship to the lion's share of the Palestinian population in the country, offering it rights and opportunities they could not dream about in Lebanon or Egypt. This was done partly because Jordan was in control of the West Bank, which was annexed in 1950, and because it wished to consolidate its influence over Palestinian territories. For a while, this integration appeared to go well for both Palestinians and Jordanians alike. The former became an important constituent of Jordan's population, contributing towards its economy and social fiber. During the 1960s, when the Palestinian Liberation Organization began to take a leading place in the news in the Middle East, things started to deteriorate. What until then had been a political organization, under the iron fist of Yasser Arafat, the PLO started asserting itself more and more as a military force. Jordan's now substantial Palestinian population supported the PLO, and the organization soon established a significant base of operations inside Jordan. The organization made use of Jordanian soil to attack against Israel and the resultant Israeli retaliations, coupled with this, inspired the unstable circumstances inside the country. Things became even worse in 1970 during what was called Black September. The PLO had become quite free and even military enough to parallel King Hussein himself. These tensions finally exploded into violence as several planes were hijacked by the PLO and diverted to Jordan. On orders from King Hussein, the Jordanian army launched a full-scale military campaign with the express purpose of forcing the PLO out of Jordanian territory. The fighting lasted nearly a year and claimed thousands of victims, the majority of whom were Palestinians. Black September marked a turning point in Jordan's refugee policy. These violent clashes showed the dangers of allowing such a powerful, militarized group to operate within the country and Jordanian authorities were thereafter gun-shy about taking in large numbers of Palestinian refugees. Although Jordan still hosts a significant population of Palestinians today, the violence of Black September created a deep-seated mistrust between the Jordanian government and the Palestinian leadership. That continues into Jordan's cautious approach with the Palestinian refugee crisis, spending more time on internal stability than on expansion regarding its role within the Palestinian cause. All these factors make the delicate balance of religious and ethnic communities the most unremittingly fragile spot in Lebanon's political configuration. Throughout the early 1970s, this fragile state of balance was severely disrupted by the growing presence of Palestinian refugees and, more so, of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Forced to leave Jordan subsequent to the events of Black September in 1970, the command structure of the PLO moved to Lebanon quickly establishing an authoritative military and political presence. By so doing, it would have bases in southern Lebanon that it could use to attack Israel, using Lebanese territory as a base for its operations. The PLO's arrival in Lebanon precipitated a sea change in the country's internal affairs. Lebanon's population was already divided among several religious sects. Added to this was a large influx of Palestinian refugees, many of whom were pro-PLO. These fragile sectarian relations thus became even further strained. It allied itself with the Lebanese Muslim factions, primarily Sunnis, who remained somewhat marginalized by Lebanon's sectarian power-sharing system that privileged the Maronite Christian elite. This new alliance emboldened Muslim factions and increased tensions with the Christian-dominated government. By the mid-1970s, Lebanon was spiraling into anarchy. The PLO acted with so much autonomy that it turned southern Lebanon into a virtual state within a state, where it conducted its military operations and administered Palestinian refugee camps. 
Its frequent incursions and guerrilla raids across the border into Israel precipitated violent Israeli countermeasures in the form of bombing raids and cross-border forays into Lebanese territory. These tensions between the various Lebanese factions boiled over into an all-out civil war in 1975. The causes of the war were manifold, but without a doubt, the PLO did heighten the violence with its militarized presence in Lebanon. This engaged Palestinian factions, hand-in-hand -hand with other Muslim and leftist factions, in a battle against the Maronite Christian militias and the Lebanese army. This internal conflict not only ripped the social and economic fabric of Lebanon, but also involved external powers, including Israel and Syria, in its vortex, making the conflict explode further. The siege of Beirut was brutal, heavy bombardments and widespread civilian casualties. Under heavy international pressure, a U.S. brokered agreement was reached, enabling Yasser Arafat and the PLO leadership to evacuate Lebanon and resettle in Tunisia. The temporary reduction in pressure upon Lebanon resulting from the PLO's departure belied the fact that the damage had already been done. The Lebanese civil war raged until the year 1990, claiming approximately 120,000 lives and leaving the country in ruins. It brought the Lebanese infrastructure to a miserable state and entrenched sectarian divisions, which still continue to harass the country. Such was the position of the PLO in Lebanon, and such the role of the latter in this civil war, that it stands out as a grim reminder of how the juncture of an external conflict with internal vulnerabilities can destabilize a nation. More than a decade since it left, the reverberation of its time in Lebanon still echoes in the country. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees remain in grossly overcrowded camps in Lebanon, with scant rights enjoyed and less hope for integration. The Lebanese government, not wanting to repeat past mistakes, has kept tight control over these camps, fearing further destabilization. The Abraham Accords signed in 2020 have been an epical shift in new geopolitics in the Middle East. They fundamentally signal a different approach by the Arab world toward the state of Israel. Most Arab nations, backed by the principle of pan-Arabism that places a higher value on Palestinian liberation, had pursued and adopted a common stance for decades against the recognition of the State of Israel. These agreements brokered by the United States saw the UAE, Bahrain, and later Sudan and Morocco normalize relations with Israel by bypassing the long-held expectation that peace with the Palestinians must come first. This reflects the broader change of priorities across the region. For countries such as the UAE and Bahrain, a more local focus has tuned toward economic progress and modernization while seeing stability in the region. For them, the Palestinian cause, though important, has become largely symbolic and no longer informs their foreign policy. It is fair to say that the economic benefits of cooperation with Israel, especially in the technology, security, and tourism sectors, override ideological commitment to the cause of Palestinian liberation. These new partnerships mark a departure from the confrontationist politics of yesteryear and a movement toward pragmatic, forward-looking partnerships. Today, the Palestinian refugee crisis constitutes one of the longest standing in the world, with millions of refugees scattered in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and the occupied Palestinian territories. Many of these refugees live in overpopulated refugee camps with very limited access to employment, health care, and education. Most of these issues mentioned here continue unabated, with no long-term solution in sight. Palestinian refugees remain in dire straits economically and on the fringes of political life to date. At the same time, host countries continue to struggle to balance humanitarian needs with national security concerns. There is little prospect of bringing an end to this cycle of displacement and marginalization without meaningful intervention from the international community with the prioritization of national stability over Arab solidarity. As some tectonic geopolitical changes are taking place in the Middle East, especially with the signing of the Abraham Accords, most priorities in many Arab nations have shifted away from support for the Palestinian cause to building economic ties with and securing regional stability. One might ask, could these new alliances bring about a more universal solution to the Palestinian refugee crisis? Accords marked the step towards a peaceful Middle East, while the road ahead for the resolution of refugees is yet to be seen. What do you think of this? Might it be possible that, in the future, peace initiatives, similar to the Abraham Accords, can still resolve the refugee crisis? 
or will the refugee crisis continue to be a point of contention in the region? Leave your comments in the comments section below. And if you like this video, then like, share, and subscribe for more deep dives into Middle Eastern geopolitics. Don't forget to hit the bell icon so you never have to miss an update. We want to hear from you, so feel free to let us know what topics you would like to see us cover next. Thanks for watching.